And a very good afternoon to my fellow members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today participating in the 6th World Petrocoal Congress. This is my second time here. I'd like to compliment the organizers for the vision of an integrated view of fossil fuels with a focus on synergy for energy. Um, as all of us know, oil amongst the energy basket is grabbing the global attention. Uh, a year ago, we were talking about the dramatic drop in oil from $100 a barrel to what it was then. Since that last meeting, oil prices have dropped a further 45%. What's going to happen by next meeting? This low oil regime uh, we hear is clearly technology. We just heard that. New supply coming in, different types of supply. And again, demand somewhat subdued. So we're seeing now the supply coming in. There's no market for it. Well, we have seen some high cost producers shutting down. And we have a lot of wells that are being shut in and development deferred. The global inventories continue to rise. At the start of this session, the chairman offered a question. What will we do to take advantage of these low prices? Unfortunately, we're repeating the past. We're drilling less, and we're buying bigger and more SUVs. Here in India, it's about one of the largest auto sectors in terms of gro largest growth factor for auto sectors in the world, one of the healthiest auto sectors in the world. Since India is blessed, and I I'm convinced as of geology background, not as technical as that we just heard, but is, is blessed with significant untapped mineral resources, including hydrocarbons, we can focus on developing these to insulate ourselves from oil price volatility. In fact, I believe the weak oil market creates an unprecedented opportunity to permanently reduce the cost of oil drilling and exploration, thereby encouraging international oil majors and service companies to invest more in India. A year and a half ago, if you were to go, and I did go to Canada, I went to Oklahoma, to Dallas, seeking oil field service providers to come to India. They charged for their services what they called an India premium, which was roughly 50% what they charged in Oklahoma or in Canada. And that's because they just didn't know how to export things. They didn't know if they could get the permits. They could know if they could get the visas. So they just charged the prices up. We're now seeing that import premium beginning to decline. We've just heard the U.S. shale gas revolution is a classic case study in new disruptive technology as we speak impacting markets, but also creating new opportunities, including here in India. Dr. Philip asked, who would have predicted the shale revolution 20 years ago? I can remember about eight years ago at a Duke University Energy Forum uh, debating, uh, at that time we had a coal position, we were debating whether natural gas with shale gas coming in would begin to displace the coal business. That's just eight years ago. The year after that we IPO'd our, our coal business because we, we saw that that gas was coming, it was displacing the markets, it was technology overwhelming what had been preconceived notions. And I think the same thing can happen in India. According to the International Energy Agency's World Economic Outlook 2015, the demand for oil in India will increase by 6 million barrels a day till 2040, more than the growth of any other country in the world. And this growth is on average seven times the world average per year during the period 2014 through 2040. So it becomes crucial for the Indian industry to deploy state-of-the-art technology and access to the unconventional oil reserves and resources which vastly exceeds what we'd expect to see on a conventional basis. We at Kane India have been at the forefront of implementing innovative technologies to realize and grow its, its oil and gas production capabilities. We've successfully leveraged the unconventional drilling technologies from North America to drill and frack horizontal and vertical wells. We've been focusing on monetizing the tight oil reservoirs through, through efficient reserve development and deploying of fracking technologies and later uh, enhanced oil recovery technologies. We've seen the first application of micro-seismic hydrofrack monitoring technology and multi-stage fracking of wells here in India, pumping at the latest count three stages in a single day at one of our wells, a first in India by any operator in the conventional oil and gas field. We've executed one of the world's, the world's largest polymer flood enhanced oil recovery in Rajasthan. This will not only help enhance and sustain economic production from the block in the foreseeable future, even at today's prices, but will also maximize economic recovery from the block. As we speak, we're injecting about 330,000 barrels of polymer solution 
per a day into the into the fields, and resulted that we're getting uh, the last fiscal quarter about 19,000 barrels of oil additional per day. Next stage, beyond the polymer addition, we're also looking at the injection of alkali surface uh, surfactant polymers, and these essentially strip whatever remaining oils left on the sand grain. And to this end, in the last fiscal year, we've successfully completed a Mangala ASP project with encouraging results. And so we've seen that we can cut the water decline from 90% to 20% to 30% observed within the first three weeks of the alkaline injection trial. Also, as a first in India, we've conducted time-lapse 4D seismic technology, first in India, using ocean bottom cable seismic survey at Arava Field. With billions of seismic data samples were collected and processed using superconductors, not only looking at the three dimensions of geometry, but the fourth dimension of time. This infill drilling campaign, looking at how the flow rates have changed, have allowed us to identify where there were trapped pockets and trapped areas of oil, and we've allowed us to do infill drilling, and we've been able to successfully get additional oil from those sections. There's more that we can do, and there's more that we will do. So the disruptive technological advances in drilling and fracking are reshaping not only the North American oil and gas industry, they are reshaping the Indian oil and gas industry. And that's going to have worldwide implications that more and more countries begin to adapt, begin to modify, and begin to improve upon those technologies, which is just a matter of time. Individual energy companies will be busy coping with each, and any, each individual success. But this is just going to add more oil. It's going to put more pressure on the markets. And it's going to further increase that imbalance in the global oil market. And people will still be buying more automobiles and more SUVs. The cycle will continue. For a nation undergoing transformational change like India, a simple and straightforward looking policy to encourage new investment that maximizes domestic oil and gas production would be a key enabler. And this is even more important in attracting foreign majors and foreign investment at a time when oil prices are an all-time low. I'd much rather be drilling in India than drilling offshore West Africa or many other difficult parts of the world where, where the majors are drilling now. I'm encouraged to see the government of India's commitment to the Make in India campaign. I'd like to see more find in India. The Indian policymakers should develop long-term strategies which help minimize the increasing vulnerability to future energy price fluctuations. We have the capacity and the resources required for this. And I do wish to emphasize that let's not let this weaker price reduce that urgency for energy self-sufficiency. History has shown that low oil prices do lead to low investment and they do lead to high consumption. And that over time creates new shortages. We will have future energy shocks, even without the inevitable geopolitical shocks. We should not assume that today's oil prices are a permanent gift to the Indian economy. Higher prices are just a matter of time and likely to return at some point in the future. So with this larger context, beyond technology, let me also talk about some simple but very effective policy measures which can be considered by the government of India for reinvigorating India's exploration and production sector for oil and gas. First of all, we believe it's important to adopt an efficient risk-sharing arrangement between the government and the investor to monetize the nation's natural resources. For example, CES right now is a very specific tax on oil production put in place at a time when oil was $100 a barrel. And at that time, 4,500 rupees per ton. It seemed reasonable at the time. It now impacts about 95% of the oil production even though imports go untaxed. At current oil price levels, the cess rate has remained the same. So as a, concept, as a concept, as a as a result of that, right now for us, that cess rate constitutes about 40% of our net realizable value for oil. Something that was an 8% tax has become a 40% tax just when we can least afford it. This is an issue. This is a challenge. So for the survival of the industry, it would benefit if the cess rate was made on an ad valorem basis at different prices, different payments, at a rate between 5 to 8 percent of the realized price of the oil. As all of you know, and we talked about this earlier today, oil production is capital intensive. Investments have to be made for the long term. 
So we do believe that a simple and progressive outlook for production sharing contract extensions would enable companies to look ahead, effectively plan, and commit significant additional investments to maximize the nation's resource potential. Low oil prices will compel global oil and gas companies to review their portfolios as they are now and rework, i.e. reduce, their investment strategy. It is expected that those that have still investments planned will redirect those investments to the countries which offer stable and predictive policy regimes coupled with a balanced risk-reward ratio. I believe India can position itself in this space. Therefore, consistent policies would attract global majors for the benefit of the nation. I think it's also important to adopt an efficient and integrated energy pricing policy. There should be fair price realization for hydrocarbon output. And when I mean fair price, something that can be measured against the indexes, transparent indexes for globally traded oil and gas. We do need to respect and trust the markets for their ability to generate an efficient outcome. Our operating model would be equally simple, efficient and equal, easy governance. So every possible effort should be made to simplify business processes, introduce policies that are easy to administer and audit. Keeping in line with our honorable prime minister's vision, we should move toward a government's model which is based on self-certification. I'm absolute believer, whether you're looking at resources or IT or manufacturing, over the coming years, India will see a significant improvement in productivity and increased willingness by companies to enjoy and deploy high-end technologies. For us, it's going to be fracking. It's going to be how we search. It's going to be the geophysics. It's going to be 4D. It's going to be polymer injection. It's going to be alkaline treatment post the polymer injection. These will all be part and parcel of the toolkit to enhance the oil, the, the, the country's future oil resources. India like the U.S., should embrace the private sector in fully exploiting these unconventional resources. I don't think there's an industry out there that demands a more diverse set of human, mechanical, and technological capabilities than the oil and gas exploration and production industry. So getting the policy right will get the sector right, and that can contribute then to India's economic renaissance. I've spoken entirely about the oil business put today, but this is a petro coal conference, so let me say, say a few words about coal. For us, our Vedanta business relies entirely on coal for our aluminum sector smelting. And we're the largest producer of aluminum in the country. It is a green metal. We're also a very large producer of, of power for IPP purposes. India itself has huge future coal requirements for its own electrification and expanding its manufacturing capacity. Coal demand in India will substantially increase not only over the next several years, but the next several decades. And India should be as self-sufficient as possible in its own coal requirements. I do recognize, both in terms of plant configurations and locations, coastal plants are best suited for coal imports. However, coal-fired power plants within major coal-producing interior basins, such as those we have in Odisha and Chhattisgarh, should be competitively serviced from local coal mines from those basins. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And we may see our inland power plants even relying more on imports next year as compared to this year. And this year, they're relying more on them than they were last year. All we're doing is helping the coal traders out there, and as we heard earlier today, the occasional coal mine in Australia. We support Coal India's recent efforts to expand its production capacity with linkage schemes available for both IPP and CPP producers. We'd like to see greater diversification of Indian coal sources, including more access to captive coal and the emergence of independent commercial coal capabilities, which would incur, uh, encourage global coal miners and their technologies to come to India. Over a third of India's population does not have adequate access to electricity, and coal will be a key part of the solution. I thought there were some good sessions this morning about clean coal and carbon. So before I close, I'd like to say a few words about climate change and the role of fossil fuels in the post-COP21 Paris world. At Vedanta, we have to intensify our efforts at energy efficiency. We need to do that just to survive in this low-price environment. But it's also going to be important for the overall carbon intensity of India. 
It's also important to develop India's untapped other resources, including hydro. In the long term, change needs to be affected over time <coughs> in carbon to also reflect India's other urgencies, other priorities. Ultimately, technology and innovation will drive the solutions, include, including more competitive renewables, notably solar, and an application of carbon capture and sequestration. And I did really appreciate the comments this morning by Andrew Michener, which I personally support. So far, if we look at how the carbon mo movement's being addressed, how it was being debated in carbon, it's very much along the lines of we will ignore oil and gas and coal, let's focus on something more sexy. I do believe that technologies that can take fossil fuels and ren render them into efficient and effective carbon-free emissions is the best part of the solution. And I think for India and for China, carbon capture and sequestration is, a big best, is the best pathway for that. So to close, India will need more oil. India will need more coal to further its industrialization, to further its manufacturing, to further its poverty alleviation. India has great potential for both oil and gas and coal. And this will require a concerted combination of proactive energy policy and the application of the world's best technology. Thank you very much.